So giving folks a few more seconds to get on. All right, great. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Carolyn Kuski. I'm the executive director of the Wharton Risk Center. And thank you all so much for joining us for today's webinar. Today, we are going to talk about the soon to be finalized report of the California Climate Insurance Working Group. The link is up here on the screen if anyone wants to review the draft. Uh, and we're going to use that as a jumping off point to discuss how we can better harness insurance as a tool for climate resilience, and not just in California, but in the rest of the US and other countries as well. And we're going to talk about recent innovations, which are most promising, and what we need to advance them. I also want to note that this webinar is part of a series that the Wharton Risk Center is doing through the latter half of 2021 on topics around insurance and climate change. So you can see more about the series um, at the link there. We have several um, other upcoming ones that I hope you will find uh, equally interesting. Um, this is being recorded and will be available on the website afterward. I also just wanted to quickly note to feel free to introduce yourself and chat to everyone so folks know who's on and where you're from. Um, if you have questions for our panelists, though, please use the Q&A function um, and we'll try to pull, have time to pull some of those at the end. Um, but again, don't put your questions in chat, put them into that Q&A box. Um, all right, so with that, I'm so excited to um, introduce you to our group of panelists that we have us joining today. I don't think you could have a better set of folks to talk about this topic. Um, they're each going to give you roughly five minutes of kind of introductory comments on this, and then we'll turn into the questions. Um, and I'll just introduce each of them really briefly before they get started. So um, Mike Peterson is going to kick things off for us. He's the inaugural deputy commissioner of climate and sustainability branch for Commissioner Lara in the California Department of Insurance. And in this role, he's been leading multiple initiatives at reducing climate risk and increasing resilience, including managing the group whose report is our jumping off point today. Um, he also leads the department's partnership with the UN on principles for sustainable insurance. And prior to being at the department, he was a policy consultant in the California State Senate. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Mike. So Mike, take it away. Thank you, Carolyn. Sorry. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. Uh, Carolyn, I really appreciate you giving me a chance to be here and for your longtime leadership on resilience and, and these new issues that we're talking about today. Um, so as you mentioned, my name is Mike Peterson. I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Climate Sustainability, and I'm happy to talk to you today about sort of an overview of what the Climate Insurance Working Group has been working on for the past nearly two years. Um, what I'd like to do is, you know, you have a link to the report, but I would want to just kind of hit on a couple of key points in my time here. Um, first, how the group approached the problem. Secondly, um, some of the initial highlights. And thirdly, what, what's new and exciting? And what, what do I think is important? And that'll hopefully kickstart the discussion for today. Um, so first off, how did this group approach these draft recommendations? This uh, working group has 18 members that include climate experts from public policy, from environmental groups, um, from scientific organizations, and from the insurance uh, sector. And what the legislature in California directed this group to do was to put a particular focus on a series of questions that blended together natural infrastructure like wetlands and forests with future concerns over uh, insurance availability and affordability. And the working group took those questions and forged a, um, a uh, mission statement that focused on how do we identify and assess and recommend risk transfer approaches to reduce the risks of climate change impacts that include, but not, but not exclusively, insurance incentives and promote nature-based solutions. Um, and so they really are trying to be the overlap, the blending zone between kind of traditionally disparate fields of insurance, uh, ecology, land management, um, and where and how we build. So how can we reduce future losses to promote a sustainable insurance market? Um, the fund, two fundamental pieces, I think, inform the initial part of this group. The first is that pre-disaster mitigation can be very cost effective. Um, there's a study by the National Institute of Building Sciences that noted that every dollar spent in pre-disaster mitigation can save up to $6 in disaster cost after the fact. So there's, there's a really strong incentive financially to work on investing in pre-disaster strategies rather than waiting for an event to happen and then trying to recover from it. Um, the second big piece of information is, is how wetlands and forests and 
urban greening play into these risks? Um, you know, there's a very well publicized story about the northeastern wetlands reducing damages by over $600 million during Superstorm Sandy. And so you start to ask these questions. California is a place where there's significant um, climate risk. There's also significant interest in the natural ecology. How do you blend these two things together? Um, and so this, this report that um, you have access to and is in draft form has draft recommendations that, that hit on a number of different topics. But uh, the last thing I'd like to say about the approach of the working group is they really took a look at it through the lens of risk management. And you know what one of my colleagues calls the risk management continuum of how do we assess the risk and then communicate the risk, then reduce the risks, and then the remaining risks that are there, how do we use risk transfer and insurance to build more resilience? Um, and so looking through that lens, you'll see that this report breaks down along those themes. How do we assess the risk, communicate it, reduce it, and then come up with risk transfer options to deal with some of the risks that we see that is there. And that with climate change, we see as accelerating. That leaves us with sort of five general buckets of policies that, that are in these recommendations. Um, there's recommendations related to hazard mapping and disclosure, um, disclosure of risks. Uh, there's recommendations related to land use and building codes. How do we reduce risks through those decisions? Um, there's recommendations that are focused specifically on closing the, the protection gap. In California, we have significant risks, some of which there's a, um, a decent amount of insurance uptake, others where there's not as much. How do we close those gaps? Um, fourth, what are some nature-based solutions that we can integrate into our strategies, whether by themselves or with insurance, to help solidify those nature-based strategies as they move forward and make them more sustainable. And then fifth, how does innovation and mitigation um, play into the future role of insurance dealing with climate change disasters? And this group identified both parametric insurance policies and community insurance policies as two avenues um, to investigate moving forward. So to wrap up the intro of my uh, talk here, I just want to say that there's a couple of takeaways that I want to share that I think are new and innovative. First, this working group at their outset in September of 2019 decided that of all the things to focus on, they were going to focus on wildfires, flooding, and extreme heat. And here we are nearly two years later, and those risks still um, are very timely and have grown in concern in terms of how we deal with them. Um, in addition, the focus on nature-based solutions as a, as a way to approach these risks has also grown. The science has been pushing forward on this, and so it's an exciting place to really have focused attention. Um, and especially when it comes to extreme heat, there are very few insurance policies or risk transfer um, concepts that are targeted at extreme heat. Um, that's not a traditional focus of insurance, and I think it's important that this group took a hard look at that. But the second and sort of broader theme I wanted to point out is that um, Throughout this report, the working group was trying to blend together risk reduction and risk transfer. And these are, are historically two different policy areas. But if you can put them together and you can base it at a community level where investments in watersheds, investments in urban greening can have a community level impact, then you may be able to um, you know, benefit resilience by both including that risk reduction and risk transfer. And that's ultimately the goal here. If we can buffer the impacts of climate change and build capacity to recover, that's going to be the equation that leads to resilience. And that's what I hope that this report will help facilitate as a conversation. And so I'll end with just saying that, you know, this is a report of 40 recommendations. Um, they're focused on partnerships between state and local government, between state and federal government, and between the public and private sectors. And I think that the, the future success and creativity that comes out of those partnerships will be um, a really strong fundamental to whether these are successful strategies. And so I thanks a lot for being here and for having this conversation, Carolyn. Great, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, thanks for setting the stage for the conversation. Um, we're gonna now kick it over to Alex. Alex Kaplan is the Executive Vice President of Alternative Risk for Amwins Group, the largest wholesale insurance distributor. He leads the development and execution of innovative risk transfer solutions like parametric insurance, which maybe he'll say more about uh, today. He's also responsible for developing new products and capital sources for Amwins, its retail customers and their clients. And before joining Amwins, um, he was the head of Swiss Re North America's public sector solutions unit. So Alex, kicking it over to you now. 
Sure. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me uh, in organizing this and uh, congrats to the group for for coming forward with these recommendations. I think it's very powerful to do it in such a, an official and uh, formal and public fashion <clears throat> to elevate these topics uh, and continue to elevate these topics. Obviously, as, as Mike pointed out, right, we the headlines every single day, including uh, even today, uh, an article in The New York Times about the impact on the on the winery business in Northern California. Right. And if you just look at the insured losses, from the wildfires in the last four years, if you add them up cumulatively, it would be one of the top five natural disasters to ever hit the United States. Um, and so the problem is not going away. Um, and and it's, it's, it's prudent, obviously, to, to find different solutions. And, and Mike's absolutely right, right? Uh, each one of these elements in and of itself is an important step, but, but you need the whole recipe to gather all the ingredients to come up with a, a solution to truly build resilience. Um, so I think what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about innovation. I think probably innovation is one of the last things people think about when they think about insurance, right? It's a 300 year old plus industry. And, um, and uh, you know, I think it's important to, to talk about some of the, the changes that have occurred in the last couple of years, right? And if you look at a couple of, of, of data points, right? If you look at the computational power of the industry, if you look at the digitization of data and you look at technology, Moore's law very much applies now in the context of the insurance industry in terms of the innovation that's occurring, right? We are light years ahead now than we were only a couple of years ago. And this uh, facilitates the creation of new products, right? Now, Mike talked about the protection gap. And that protection gap is the differential between the total economic cost of disasters and the proportion of which is actually insured, right? And we see the trend line on both of these uh, items increasing year over year. But the alarming trend line for me is the, the differentiating trend lines between the insured portion and the economic portion. Those trend lines are diverging at about 7% a year, right? So less insurance is covering more risk or, or there's more risk and more loss and less of it's actually being covered by insurance. And we can attribute that to a number of things, right? We certainly can attribute that to increased severity and frequency of disasters, the accumulation of wealth and assets in the most disaster prone areas. But I would actually venture to say, and it's a little controversial to say this in my industry, which is that the evolution of risk is occurring faster than the innovation in the solutions, right? So the value that people see in the solutions is diminishing, and therefore they're not buying it with a greater great frequency and in great volume. Um, but I would say that the the silver line to this is, as is, is you pointed out, Carolyn, is one field that I'm particularly uh, in, interested in, which is parametric insurance, right? This is the idea of not underwriting a specific asset or portfolio of assets in the traditional sense, but you're actually underwriting the circumstances around a particular event, right? You take hurricane insurance, right? You know, as, as, as opposed to sending out adjusters and figure out what was broken and how much it's worth and bickering back and forth and settling a claim over several months. What you're doing in this particular case is you're looking at the wind speed or you're looking at the central pressure of a hurricane. And there's obviously a correlation between the intensity of the wind and the amount of damage it does on the ground. And by doing so, and a settling uh, a structure based on that, on that function, the wind speed, you can pay out the claim very quickly, right? As the report, uh, dictates is that this the speed the quality of recovery is dictated by the speed of recovery right so by having that quick infusion of cash is absolutely paramount and secondly because you're underwriting the event you have the greatest flexibility in use of the proceeds right and so how many times do we hear stories about well i had insurance and it covered x y and z but boy i i, I really spent a lot of money recovering in this other way whether it be you know i had to move out of my house for a period of time uh, I lost business as a result of the area being shut down due to evacuations, et cetera, and that not being covered, right? That in, in large part is solved by parametric insurance. And so I'll, I'll just highlight maybe one or two different examples. Um, parametric insurance has been around in some form or fashion since the mid nineties, roughly, really focused in the weather space. And what you saw, and Simon had a big role in this, is, is actually seeing this grow mostly in evolving in emerging markets. Um, where there is no underwriting information. So you had to develop some sort of a proxy uh, data set to, to underwrite a risk. And so that's where some of the greatest innovations occurring. So one example is in Kenya. It's called the Kenya Livestock Insurance Program. Some, some people are going to be familiar with this. But this idea that there are large populations of pastoral herders 
that live off of you know uh, a handful of livestock and that that's their entire livelihood and when drought conditions ensue the grazing land deteriorates and they're forced to pick up their families and their livestock and move to other places and in doing so they cross into other tribal territories tribal disputes break out and people hundreds of people actually die every single year simply because they're trying to move their sheep goats cattle whatever to better grazing land how does the insurance industry have any role in fixing that problem, right? Because typically what insurance does, it comes in after the bad things happened and tries to compensate them and rebuild their lives. But if we can use the technology and the data digitization and the computational power of the industry to anticipate the loss, that changes everything, right? So in this particular instance, what we're doing is we're using satellite imagery to detect the lushness of the vegetation. If the grass is really green, we know the cows are fat and happy. If it's deteriorating to yellow and to brown, we know that they're, gonna, they're at risk and they're going to start to pick up and move. Instead of letting them move, you're immediately loading funds onto their cell phones so that they can call and feed in water trucks and they stay put. And it's literally saving lives. So that's just an example of how we're able to use that new technology to anticipate a risk scenario and prevent a loss from occurring in the first place, right? And we're seeing this being replicated in other places around the globe as well. And it has equal application in the most advanced insurance market, the most largest economy in the world, the United States. So for example, in the Philippines, they have, you know, what they're starting with is anticipatory finance. This idea that a typhoon is coming, right? As opposed to people making the decision I, I don't have the money to evacuate. I can't put my family in a hotel or find other shelter. I can't put gas in my car. I can't feed my family in restaurants for a week while we deal with wildfire uh, you know, evacuations, is immediately loading funds onto their cell phone so that they can take care of those expenses. Because if you look at the number of people that die in weather-related disasters in the US, the empirical data shows that for two reasons. One is lack of communication, Two is lack of financial capacity, right? And those are both addressable. And so th those are just a, a couple of examples. I'm sure hopefully Simon will touch on, on reef insurance, um, broadly speaking, but this idea of using nature-based solutions to protect communities, right? Um, so in the context of Mexico, right, we use uh, parametric insurance to insure the reef. The parametric insurance mechanism is not that creative or innovative. What was really revolutionary was this idea of ensuring something that no one actually owns, right? And if we can draw a line between the value of this asset that no one owns and the financial vibrance of the community that is protected by it, knowingly or unknowingly, they have an insurable interest. And so in doing that, we can protect the reef, which protects the economy that, that benefits from it. And I'll, I'll stop there. Great, thank you so much, Alex. Um, we're gonna turn now to Simon and, and Alex teed up some, some possible things for you to respond to there. Um, Simon Young is the global lead for parametric innovation in Willis Towers Watson's Climate and Resilience Hub. He leads the hub's work in um, innovative collection, modeling and use of hazard and risk data and risk management tools and risk financing instruments to promote greater resilience. Um, he also played a leading role in the development, implementation and operations of the three um, multi-country parametric insurance risk pools. I don't know if he's Going to touch on those today, but that's another um, good example we have. So, um, Simon, over to you. Thanks very much, Carolyn, um, for uh, for organising this, and it's a real honour to be on this panel with such uh, esteemed fellow panelists. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, nature-based solutions and insurance potential for insurance an insurance role there, um, and then I'll also touch a little bit on the protection gap element and uh, pick up on, from what Alex was, was saying earlier. Um, so on, on the nature-based solutions, and it's great that, that Mike uh, in his introduction talked about you know, a, an integrated risk management approach. Um, I think one of the things we've seen over the last couple of years with nature-based solutions is that um, there's been a lot of expectations put on them um, which, which, and insurance aspects of them, which uh, I think we need to be careful to manage. Uh, insurance can be complementary and a facilitator of, um, of bringing nature more into the risk management space uh, and using it and, and driving the right incentives, um, but it's not a solution in and of itself. Um, and so we need to be careful that uh, we, we don't talk about um, in, in ensuring nature-based solutions um, as you know, the, whole, the whole answer. 
Um, so some of the, the ways we've been kind of looking at this, what, one is that we have started to think about mainstreaming nature uh, into, or the value of nature and the protective value of nature in particular into mainstream catastrophe risk models. Um, you know, you can't really start to think about insuring, insuring things uh, unless you can model them. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of progress made on modeling um, the, the protective value, uh, as Mike, Mike said, of, of, of wetlands in the Northeast from Sandy, for example. Um, but that hasn't really been mainstream. Those have been standalone studies. So I think um, if we can start to, to identify, have the ability to identify the benefits, the risk reduction benefits of, of, uh, of nature in cat models, then that will help to mainstream um, mainstream the whole space and the understanding of the risk into the into the kind of terms and uh, that the insurance industry works in. Um, the second is is that the, the the values of the ecosystem service values um, are increasingly recognized uh, globally, uh, but particularly in the US and in North America more more broadly. Um, it's it's an advancing science or, or e e field of economy still, but uh, what, we, what we see uh, for sure is that the value is widely distributed. There are a lot of beneficiaries of ecosystem services and, um, and therefore they're not always suitable for individual insurance coverage, um, be that the personal lines or the commercial lines actually. Um, and so I think community, community approaches to insurance um, will be better able to capture the kind of the community benefits that are provided um, by by nature. Um, and there's lots of, you know, different ways you can think about this. But um, but I do, I do think it's going to be uh, challenging to convert uh, the value of um, ecological forestry, for example, into an individual homeowner's insurance policy, um, wh whether it's the price of that or whether it's available at all you have to work at the community level to be able to capture those values, I think. And that, that creates a whole bunch of opportunities about thinking about kind of recasting insurance um, and catastrophe insurance in many, uh, in many settings. And Carolyn, you know, I, I take my hat off to you and, and the team there at Wharton who have been doing, doing this work, doing the deep thinking behind these sorts of ideas for, for many, many years and recognizing that these changes need to happen. And I think the climate crisis um, is, is going to be, you know, the final nail in the, in the coffin of the traditional approaches to insurance, um, I think. Um, and then the, the, the third thing we've been, you know, pushing forward is, is parametric solutions. Um, they, they really are um, most easily applicable to nature-based um, or ecosystem resilience and the use of insurance. And, um, but we think they have a much wider um, value too, as, as Alex was, was saying. And as we're recognizing, capturing, needing to disclose more and more climate risk. And I think increasingly within the next three to five years, I think similar disclosure regulations will be uh, in the pipeline or in place for uh, biodiversity as well. Um, and so um, I think this is going to, uh, to trigger more and more uh, close inspection of, um, of the risk management approach to protecting biodiversity, nature, uh, and mitigating climate change. Um, I wanted to give two particular applications um, of the kind of thing we're doing. One is where um, we're applying in uh, parametric insurance where the value of having money very quickly uh, is high. Um, and so the reef insurance that Alex mentioned, uh, we're kind of expanding on that, that thinking and pulling material off, off a reef and sticking uh, literally sticking with glue, uh, coral heads back onto uh, onto the um, to the main framework of the coral is incredibly valuable from a um, from a eventual recovery timeline perspective um, because material washing around on a reef in the days and weeks after a hurricane does way more damage than the, the than the day of or the couple of days of the hurricane itself. So, um, and then getting reattaching the corals has a um, has a finite window of opportunity to do that. Um, and that's very much more cost effective than than bringing in nursery grown corals. So, so we're rapid act and, and there's, there's examples, you know, um, in, in, in nature, but there's also in the in our in our own um, 
situations everywhere in the, both the developed and the developing world uh, where rapid action is incredibly valuable. Um, and so, um, so I think that that's, that's something we're exploring and that's certainly a very strong value proposition for parametric insurance, which can pay out pretty much immediately. Um, but there's also um, being, just being able to say that, that you can insure you know, nature or a nature-based solution um, can, can bring a lot of value in, in unlocking uh, invest, investment in, investor interest or you know, business planning interest in doing something that might otherwise not be able to be done. Um, and um, you know, there's different ways to, uh, to view that, but if you're say investing in a, uh, in a protected area management company who, is, who has a license to charge user fees, um, so it has a, there's a business model which is um, able to, um, to generate the money to do the conservation work that, that um, they're, like, they're also obligated to do. Uh, that, that's a business that, that can be interrupted by a catastrophe event. Um, and, um, and the shorter that interruption occurs for, the better the business is. And, and so if you, can, um, if you can ensure for that business interruption and also for the recovery funds, uh, which might not otherwise be there, then uh, that, that's really, really, really helpful. And so this unlocking um, nature-based solutions as reasonable uh, investment propositions is, is really valuable. Um, then the last, last point I'd make is, is more, more generally on the protection gap. You know, Alex talk, gave a couple of examples um, and we're really seeing that um, the kind of work that we, we, quite a few of us on the panel here have been doing for 15 years or so, um, mainly in emerging economies, uh, has real value as, um, as communities and, and um, municipalities and counties and states here in the US uh, and in Canada as well, um, are looking at, looking at ways that they can help their populations to prepare for and then recover from quickly from uh, natural disasters. And the protection gap is absolutely real in, uh, in the, the global north. And uh, I don't think we've fully realized how big that gap is yet. And uh, I think as we do, and part of that is gonna be through these disclosure obligations, then I think parametric tools, which we've, we've tested, we, we know kind of what works and what doesn't um, from, from our work in the emerging economies uh, is gonna be increasingly uh, deployed to uh, across a range of, of hazards, including extreme heat. Um, you know, the, the extreme heat parametrics are basically weather derivatives for hot days, successive hot days. And energy companies have been using this, uh, both supply and um, on, the, on the kind of oil side, as well as on the power generation side and supply side um, for 25 years uh, or more. So those products do exist. We can scale them up to, uh, to cover municipalities, uh, communities, etc. So, uh, so we have these tools, and uh, I think we're going to find a lot, of, a lot of really interesting and useful ways to deploy them. Great, thank you so much, Simon. Um, we're already such an interesting conversation. Let me now turn it over to Samantha Medlock. She is the senior counsel for the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, and she led the development of the Climate Crisis Action Plan for Congress on climate science, resilience, public health, national security, and financial risk. Um, she joined the committee from a private sector role in climate risk management, and before that, she was a senior advisor in the Obama White House, coordinating across the executive office of the president and the administration to reduce the risks and costs of climate change and disasters, um, including managing the White House Climate Insurance Partnership. Um, so now, Sam, let me kick it over to you. Great, thank you very much, Carolyn, and, and echoing the, uh, the thanks for your leadership and your work um, on these issues and for the great work of, of the team out of California. Um, it's uh, an honor to be with this panel and to see so many um, friends in the audience. Um, by way of background, the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis was stood up in the previous con Congress in the 116th um, to develop recommendations for action that the Congress could take to confront the climate crisis across its full dimensions from reducing emissions, advancing renewables, um, addressing environmental justice and the disproportionate impacts of the climate crisis on black and brown communities and low income communities, um, and also uh, addressing um, adaptation and resilience and strengthening the preparedness of our nation uh, to the impacts of, of climate that we can no longer avoid. I'm not gonna take 
our, our limited time together uh, this afternoon to go over all 700 of our recommendations that we made. But I really want to zero in on, on a few key buckets and, and talk with you briefly about where we are right now, because uh, we're making, I think, really good progress um, with a, uh, an administration and a Congress that are, um, that are leaning in on these issues and that are pushing in the same directions for the first time in, in quite a while. Uh, but if I were to break down our recommendations that I think are really relevant to this discussion, I'd, I'd put it in a few buckets, first and foremost, around climate science information and climate risk information. So we call for robust investments in the basic science of, uh, of, of climate change, as well as um, climate risk information. We need to go, for example, on flood way beyond these outmoded approaches of the so-called 100-year flood. Um, we need to uh, take a much more nuanced look at the flood threat. Uh, we need to be looking beyond the so-called 100-year floodplain, and we need to stop racing down the highway at 75 miles an hour looking only in the rear view. And by that, I mean only looking at the historical record of flood. Um, so we call to develop a strong basis of climate risk information um, not only about today's risk, but about what tomorrow's risk can bring. Um, we also call for robust investment in strengthening the built environment and in better leveraging uh, the natural resources that are out there, providing good protection every day, whether it's filtering pollutants, absorbing carbon um, and other uh, greenhouse gas emissions, or providing buffering against storms and impacts and mitigating heat islands, for example. We call for strong investments in identifying uh, what natural resources are bringing and in, in strengthening and protecting those. And obviously the big conversation in Washington right now um, around infrastructure bills and investing in our nation's recovery. Um, we are looking at ways to embed uh, climate resilience and preparedness um, in those bills, which is kind of a live effort. Literally, as we speak, I'm taking some incoming on that front that's very encouraging. Uh, but another big bucket that we want to invest in is in technical assistance, uh, making sure that states, local governments, tribes, and territories have the resources that they need to interpret the information that's put in front of them. Um, we also recognize that uh, that there are great innovations that are already online and performing well outside the US. We've talked this afternoon about parametric insurance. Uh, there's great demonstration of the value of catastrophe bonds in better identifying and helping to stabilize risk across um, uh, uh, federal portfolios already. And so one of the things that we call for is to investigate what are the ways that insurance can be better brought to bear in federal policy and practice? Is it time for us to think about um, doubling down on insurance as a means of measuring risk before the disaster strikes? We know that there's value, not just in risk transfer, but in the more refined and actionable data and information that an insurance solution can provide, even if you never have to file a claim. And then we also want to see a better understanding of what these sort of trigger-based insurance solutions like parametric insurance and catastrophe bonds can be bringing uh, to, uh, to manage risk, deploy capital quickly in the wake of a big disaster. Um, and that's my timer. So the last thing I'll mention is that across all of this, we also have to be thinking about how we bring these solutions to bear, not just for, um, those communities that can afford uh, the, the sort of newest thing. Um, but how can we make sure that we're bringing these solutions within reach of low income communities as well? And that we're deploying these solutions in ways that also address the chronic um, injustice of the ways that both pollution and disasters and the climate crisis are hitting communities of color. Uh, so I'll wrap up there, looking really forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Samantha. And I think that was a really important point to end on. Okay, let me now turn over to Craig Stewart, who leads national work on disaster resilience and climate change at the Insurance Bureau of Canada, um, which is the insurance association representing the property and casualty industry in Canada. Prior to his work with IBC, he directed the Ottawa Bureau and Arctic Program for WWF Canada. He handled pandemic liaison, trade liaison, and humanitarian donations for GlaxoSmithKline, directed a federal, provincial, territorial program at Natural Resources. Resources Canada and new to me, I didn't realize he's also the author of two atlases on the Rocky Mountains of Alberta, uh, British Columbia and Montana. So Craig, um, let me turn it over to you. <laughs> Take it away. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Carolyn. Thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, congrats to Wharton for your leadership, uh, not just on this issue, but on uh, issues of, uh, of importance to the Canadian insurance industry, including earthquake. Uh, and, and congrats to the uh, to the Working Group on Climate Resilience and Insurance for a, uh, a terrific report. Uh, we're having, uh, boy, very aligned conversations in Canada, not surprisingly. Uh, we are a bit behind in some ways uh, and maybe a bit ahead in others of the US, um, but, uh, but we're facing overall the exact same challenges. So let me uh, just talk about the importance of systemic approaches uh, to these issues uh, with an illustration, and then let me uh, and on a, just a little bit of a personal anecdote. Um, so first, with regards to uh, systemic approaches to addressing the protection gap. Uh, so uh, we're in the midst, there, there's been two pivot points, I would say, on climate resilience uh, in, uh, for Canada. One was the 2013 floods in uh, Calgary and in Toronto. And the second uh, is the events that we're experiencing right now this summer. Um, the, the first pivot point in 2013 really woke up the insurance industry to consumer demand for overland flood insurance in Canada, uh, which we were not offering systematically across the country. We looked at the issue, spent a couple of years, got flood mapping together so we could underwrite it, but then realized there was no way that we were going to be able to offer a comprehensive solution that would address high risk uh, uh, folks uh, uh, across Canada, uh, which represent probably about 10% of the residential housing base in, in the country. Um, so we uh, have worked with uh, the uh, federal government in particular, but all provinces, um, to uh, develop a national flood action plan to take that systemic approach. And it is it has been based on um, uh, several key uh, pillars, I would say. Uh, the, the, the precept is, um, uh, move and uh, or seriously mitigate uh, through heavy investment uh, those residences which are at the highest risk of flooding and then uh, ensure and retrofit the rest. Um, and, and what came out of that in 2019 uh, was, uh, and this was a, as a result of uh, two years of uh, cross-country discussions, uh, what came out of that was a series of programs. One was uh, essentially uh, a task force uh, to study the introduction of Canada's first high-risk insurance pool. We don't have one yet in, in the country as a public-private partnership between the uh, governments, uh, federal and provincial governments and the insurance industry. Uh, that uh, task force is well along now. It's about halfway through its work. Um, the second uh, was a formalized program of strategic retreat to move those at heaviest uh, uh, you know, uh, exposure from flooding. Um, and then, uh, and then a home retrofit program uh, to help retrofit homes for those that, are, that were at high risk. Um, and, uh, and, then, um, uh, and then a deep retrofit program uh, to retrofit those homes uh, that were at uh, the, the, probably the highest risk of flooding uh, that involved $40,000 uh, interest-free loans from the federal government through the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation. And that program has just been announced. So, so all that to say, uh, we, we launched a very well thought out, uh, you know, uh, uh, approach, public private partnership, I would say, uh, led by the federal government, supported by the insurance industry uh, to put a number of programs in, in place to address flooding in the country. Um, we're not there yet, uh, lots of work yet to do, uh, but, but we're well along. And part and parcel of that is a focus on natural systems, natural infrastructure. So the federal government, as part of this effort, uh, has launched a $200 million uh, program to invest in nature, where nature provides resilience to communities. And it's, it's part of the overall, uh, overall approach. Um, so uh, that's, that's the background uh, on, on, on uh, you know, taking a systemic approach. Um, 
but let me give you a bit of a personal anecdote. So three weeks ago, I was on a family trip. I landed in Vancouver, uh, spent a couple of nights in Whistler, and then proceeded down the Fraser Canyon on the way to Kelowna. Um, en route, uh, you know, I think about flooding. That's I spend 80% of my time thinking about flooding. 80, uh, en route, stopped in Lillooet uh, to take a look at uh, the, how accelerated snowmelt was basically flooding out houses in Lillooet uh, in the Fraser Canyon. Um, uh, the next town south of Lillooet, it's a little town called Lytton. Um, we stopped in Lytton uh, for lunch. It was 43 Celsius, the hottest I'd ever the hottest day I'd ever experienced in Canada. And indeed, at that point, that was the hottest day in Canadian history anywhere in our country. Um, stopped at a uh, the Kiowa Art Cafe, a small indigenous run uh, cafe in Lytton with terrific coffee. Um, three days later, uh, that entire town burned to the ground uh, through uh, wildfires that were spreading across uh, BC due to the, the dryness and the extreme heat. And 700 people uh, had uh, had passed away from heat in uh, in Vancouver, over 700 uh, in Vancouver and the surrounding area. And so, for me personally, uh, thinking about uh, you know someone who focuses, works hard on approaches uh, uh, for the insurance industry on climate, uh, we've done almost no thinking on heat. And, uh, and wildfires well behind in flood because we thought we were doing, frankly, a pretty good job of it up, up until now. Um, so all that to say is, uh, I just wanted to speak to the, uh, the importance of trying to come up with approaches uh, uh, that avoid siloing, uh, avoid focusing on one peril at a, at a time, uh, uh, or, uh, or that uh, basically take the, you know, uh, prioritize uh, the key risks that we are, that we're all facing. And, and so, of course, uh, with Mike's opening comment, the fact that two years ago you were prescient enough to, to, uh, to focus on flood, wildfires, and heat um, is really important. So the challenge for Canada going forward is this. Um, we've been rolling out programming that have been siloed. Um, we have a, a program uh, for uh, in, intended to address uh, carbon sequestration, uh, which is to uh, plant two billion trees uh, across the country mainly for their, 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 their climate mitigation effects. Uh, we need to be rethinking programming like that and talk about how are we going to be planting those trees in cities now uh, to address heat. Um, with retrofit programming, most of our retrofit programming in the country is focused on energy efficiency. We need to be rethinking the programming in Canada and the insurance industry needs to be there to incent this. Uh, how do we retrofit for climate resilience, not just flood, but wildfire and heat as well. Um, so, uh, so we've got challenges ahead. We're at, in early days because we're at this pivot point this summer of, of thinking about how we're going to move forward on it. Uh, but I just wanted to provide that from a Canadian perspective. Thank you. Great. Thank you all so much. And let me get everyone's faces back up here. Um, everyone, really insightful comments for us. I'm going to take some questions now from folks listening, and I'm actually going to merge them a little bit with some questions I had. Um, so the first question came in, Simon was directed to you about sort of what research and particular information is needed right now to really push nature-based solutions forward. And I think maybe several of you would wanna weigh in on that, but I'd actually like to broaden the question to, to a bigger one, which is we've heard lots of really exciting ideas, pilots that you all have thrown up as, um, you know, I think great ways forward for the future. What do you all see as the biggest barriers to scaling them and exploring more? And maybe that has to do with the research, but maybe there are other barriers, Craig mentioned the siloing and so on. So Simon, do you want to, we'll start with you and then anyone else jump in after him. Sure, thanks. Um, so I think the, the way of thinking around um, ecosystems and as I mentioned earlier, their valuation, the valuation of the services that ecosystems provided has a, yeah, there's a, there's an established framework. There are different ways of doing it, but um, that's reasonably well developed and is on a, on a good path. Although, you know, it can, there's certainly plenty of research to do. Uh, and it's an, a, you know, it's a, it's an evolving um, value that it's representing as well with, you know, the, the points that Craig just made be, being, uh, you know, a very, very clear and recent example of, of how our understanding of what ecosystems do for us uh, is, is evolving. Um, but that, that thinking around the, um, how we would break up hazard 
vulnerability and exposure in a in a risk understanding sense for from the insurance industry perspective has not really been applied. So um, and and we're and the data that that you need to do that is is quite lacking. I would say um, if we take reef damage as an example, we're we're building a reef damage model, um, but the 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 amount of data we have for damage after hurricanes, um, it, you know, a, a, a coral, a reef survey immediately before, immediately after, uh, very, very, very limited indeed. Um, and so, you know, we have to you, be creative in terms of uh, building those kind of relationships. So, uh, and that goes for other ecosystems as well. So, um, you know, I think that there's there's lots and lots of research that um, that that needs to continue to be done on um, on you know, getting, getting us the understanding of risk uh, and ecosystems uh, role in that uh, truly mainstreamed. And um, I think we have, we, we, we know what we need to do and we have the kind of platform into which we, we need to integrate it, but uh, it, it will take, um, you know, I think more, more, more effort to, uh, to do that. Um, we just actually finished uh, um, a project with the major conservancy on um, on the value of um, ecological forestry for uh, wildfire risk, and the main purpose of that project was actually to take the great work that um, that that uh, the TNC had done using uh, forest service wildfire modelling um, to demonstrate from a kind of quantitative modelling perspective, pure wildfire modelling perspective, what the value was, and convert that into um, the value as it appeared in a, you know, wildfire risk ranking model that an underwriter might use in California uh, for homeowners insurance. Um, and so I think more, more of those sorts of projects are going to be needed um, because it, otherwise it's going to be too easy to say, oh, you know, we, we can't capture that, that benefit or, or um, in, our, in our modeling environment and therefore we can't, you know, we can't price it in in putting it crudely. So I think that that's, that's where a lot of the concentration is going to need to be. And, and if I would just add the perspective, Carolyn, from, from Canada, I mean, we've been um, relying heavily uh, on the, uh, I guess, the groundbreaking work uh, in, uh, at the Mesoamerican Reef. I think a lot of folks obviously have been trying to replicate that. We've actually been in a very systematic way uh, exploring that concept with specific municipalities across the country over the last year. Uh, and the three challenges that we're running into, just, you know, I, I, as someone that spent a lot of time uh, trying to duplicate that model in Canada, um, the three challenges have been one, valuation. That's a big one that Simon touched on and he's gone into detail about it, but it's central. Being able to come up with some sort of uh, framework for valuing the resilience value of riparian forest, sand dunes, um, wetlands, uh, that's that's fundamental. Second, governance. Uh, the governance mechanisms to implement these sorts of projects um, it can be challenging. Um, the flood management trust uh, the, that they they put in place uh, down in Mexico and Quintana Roo uh, th that's key. That's that's we've discovered that's fundamental to uh, being able to you know pool uh, money um, uh, that can then be used for conservation or restoration. Can pay for insurance premiums. Can pay for uh, you know, reparations to, to, a, to a natural asset. Um, and uh, uh, and it, so it's, it's key. And then the third one um, uh, essentially um, that we've run into is education. Um, when, when we're dealing with chief administrative officers uh, at municipalities, uh, really there's a, there's a, there's a bit of a, a, bit of a uh, challenge there to, so that they understand that, look, those wetlands uh, that are under pressure of development and that they are uh, thinking about clearing for development, uh, that that those actually have a lot of value uh, to the uh, to the the risks uh, that they're facing, and and um, and 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 we need better communication tools uh, and, and education tools uh, to approach those sort of we'd say senior municipal bureaucrats, if you will, uh, to, uh, to 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 help them bring them along. So just to pad out Simon's answer with uh, with some of the stuff we've uh, we've uh, discovered. That's great. Let me add a little bit of an addendum to the question. Um, Andy Reid raised a question about the role of our federal disaster aid policies and that sometimes these can create a disincentive um, for investment in some of these financing and insurance mechanisms. So 
does anyone have thoughts on that as a barrier or ways that we want we might want to reshape our sort of federal response? And Craig, maybe you can say something about whether you have similar dynamics um, in Canada or Samantha, I'm not sure if your committee's thought about disaster policies and have some recommendations. Yeah, maybe you want to start with that one. Sure, I'm happy to. And yeah, I mean, Andy's making a great point. And without question, the the role of US federal disaster aid um, has served to, in a lot of ways, disincentivize investments in resilience ahead of time and to not reward the innovations that we see coming through uh, many states and local governments and tribes and territories. Uh, the, uh, the myth that um, the federal government comes in um, after a disaster and rebuilds a community quickly and efficiently uh, is one that needs to be burst quickly uh, because um, the reality is that you don't know how much federal disaster aid you're going to get. You don't know how much, uh, how fast it's going to come, uh, but I can almost guarantee you it won't be enough and it won't come fast. Um, yeah. it's, it's really one of the most inefficient ways to, uh, to address disaster um, because it's really designed to come into play uh, where um, local uh, ca capacities and capabilities have been overwhelmed. Um, and so this is where you see the select committee making recommendations and working very closely with the standing committees of the Congress that, that oversee these laws like the Stafford Act um, uh, to find ways to incentivize resilience investment and to strengthen the capacities and the capabilities of states, local governments, tribes, and territories ahead of disaster. Uh, so you see really muscular investment coming online through the, uh, the BRIC program. This is building resilient infrastructure and communities, um, but also not just focusing on the money, but focusing on that capacity building um, and, and really looking at ways that insurance can be playing more of a role. So this is about strengthening community insurability but also helping to make sure that those insurance solutions are gonna be within reach of communities. Yeah, I would second that. <clears throat> Excuse me. I mean, I think part of, that's part of the, the, the sort of the leg of the stool on risk communication, right? It's not just about talking about your exposure to perils, but it's also a little bit about talking about what government doesn't do. Um, and what what these programs are not designed for, um, you know, I've I've worked on hundreds and hundreds of of governmental entities across the country and Canada as well, and they will not buy one penny of insurance beyond what they think is required by the Stafford Act, and they are dramatically underinsured, and in in many instances completely uninsured for some of their most catastrophic perils. Um, and so it, it's the alignment of interest with, uh, with this concept of risk ownership, right? They need to understand exactly um, what their exposure is and what portion of that risk they bear themselves. And overwhelmingly, it is the vast majority of it, right? Like I said before, the, the, the speed of recovery dictates the quality of recovery, and you cannot wait um, you know, for a, a disaster declaration and hope to get the funds, uh, right? I think the, the data point was 75% of the funds that had been allocated in Hurricane Sandy had not been deployed in the first 18 months after the disaster, right? How do you rebuild with that? And, and also let's think about the underpinning of all these communities, right? Is tax revenue, right? All of these, all of the capital obligations that these communities make to invest in their citizens and, and, and their community, it is predicated on tax revenue. Well, you look at a place like Santa Rosa, California, where 20% of the housing stock burned to the ground, right? The city owned buildings were fine. They had insurance, but they didn't need it because the bit buildings themselves didn't burn, but they lost 20% of their tax paying revenue. Um, and they had to take an uncollateralized loan from the state in order to cover their bond obligations. And, you know, not to, not to pick on them, but that, cause that's, that's just an anecdote of probably hundreds. And if I could just add one comment there on, on more of like the, the one potential way forward is that, you know, if, if there's this, this is this merge, you know, as one of my colleagues likes to say that there's a top down focus and there's a bottom up focus. And at least in California right now, we have over 300 FireWise communities. We have a lot of special districts that work on some of these individualized projects. And if those sort of local, I'll call them local community level efforts could be scaled up into adding data into learning more about what works and what doesn't work and could take on some of those uh, kind of resilience um, pieces of information from the, the top down 
then you could have this merging and kind of gain some momentum from some of these localized solutions. And um, but but I agree that it is something where if you don't have some of those systems in place to to reduce risk and to be able to respond and recover, it's very difficult after the fact to create them. And so if there's some way to take some of those existing special districts and structures and make them more formidable, that could be sort of a way forward that merges some of the challenges that you've identified. Great, let me build on some of the responses you just gave and lead into the next question. Um, we talked about the challenges in delay and, and getting money with recovery. Alex, you mentioned that. Um, one of the questions that's come in is whether, is whether any of you see a role for insurance in managed retreat. But I'd like to broaden that to a bigger question for all of you and circle back to some of these examples of um, the role of insurance in reducing risks. And whether that's kind of rethinking insurance to reduce risk ahead of time, Alex, like the Kenya example, or if that's how we use insurance so that our risks in the future after we've been damaged are better thinking about like some of those burned communities or, you know, repairing the reef. Um, you know, how much do you think it's going to take or how much, how much potential is there there to, to use insurance to actually buy down our risk? I'll throw it open to any of you that want to jump in on <laughs> I'm going to jump in as a uh, as somebody who claims not to be from the insurance industry and uh, and hardly participating in it. Um, so and the joke will you know the, the rest of the panelists will know the joke. But you know I'm a physical scientist and um, I've kind of ended up in insurance as a potentially a really useful tool to manage risk um, and financial risk in particular. But um, insurance is really really valuable if it's if it's really putting a price on risk and that price is the is a risk-based price um, and you know what I see in very from a very high level in uh, in in many um, in many countries but particularly in the US is that um, you know that that the, the pricing of risk value of insurance is hugely diluted um, and so um, and it's very difficult to uh, to gather and um, yeah take advantage of the uh, of the values that insurance can bring um, if that pricing signal is uh, is lost. Um, and so, you know, and that in, in certain communities, obviously that's going to be really tough and we have to find mechanisms to uh, to, to balance that out. But um, the fact is that it is way more risky to be, you know, right on the coast in, uh, in South Florida than it is to be um, a mile inland um, and, um, and, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, so, um, you know, and unless that can be reflected, um, then, you know, the, in insurance, in the way that the insurance supports, um, you know, uh, communities uh, to become more resilient, then, um, you know, we're going to be missing, missing a big part of the value proposition. I mean, I, I would like to think that insurance certainly plays a role in, in, in communicating the risk reduction value of, of certain initiatives, right? I mean, seat belts exist in cars because of insurance. There's a fire hydrant on every city block because of insurance. Um, and certainly, I think, I think Simon's point is probably the most salient one, which is if, if the pricing signal is diluted by, by other sources of, of governmental intervention in many instances, um, then it doesn't get through. Uh, fully, um, and then people don't make make appropriate decisions. Um, and and so, if we can eliminate some of that noise or reduce some of that noise, um, then then that the, that market signal can can do its job. Great, thanks. Oh, oh, Sam, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Just from from the U.S. federal government perspective and the perspective of Congress, you know, I, I think no question we've we've got to uh, unmask risk and price signaling provides probably one of the best um, factors for transparency of risk that is out there, right? That's, that's kind of the, pur the purpose of insurance and the pricing of insurance and premiums. Um, what we've got to find a way to do, whether it's through the National Flood Insurance Program uh, or, or more broadly, is to, is to address affordability in ways that, that are not just about masking the true nature of risk. Um, we've also got to actually buy down risk to, to, to make insurance more affordable, but we've got to find a way to differentiate between those for whom paying full freight, their full uh, risk rated premium um, is, is certainly undesired or may merely inconvenient. And I would put myself in that category. 
uh, and those for whom it poses real hardship. And, um, and as long as those audiences, if you will, are, uh, are not distinct, um, then, uh, then we're, we're really not getting those who, who could and should be paying full freight uh, doing that. And, um, uh, and so this is as we look at the NFIP reauthorization um, and the reforms to that program, I think there are real opportunities uh, to get the program both communicating risk with transparency, um, but also addressing those hardship instances uh, that are very real. We have to be honest about that. Um, and, and I think that a similar dynamic applies whether we're looking at wildfire risk in our arid west um, or some of the other uh, threats and hazards that are out there. Thank you so much. And thank you, all of you. I, I have to say we've gone through an hour. So our, so our time's up, I'm sure. You know, I'd love to say and talk to all of you. Thank you for sharing your insightful comments. And um, more importantly, thank you to all of you for the um, really inspiring work you guys are all doing to help sort of better harness risk transfer for, for climate resilience. So um, thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Till next Thanks, time. Thanks, guys. Appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you. Bye-bye.